everyone, and welcome to episode 75 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. If you've been reading any of the hot takes in the news recently that claim to know something about the Middle Ages, you won't be surprised to hear people call it a backward and primitive time, a time during which science and innovation stalled, or even went backwards. And if you're a frequent listener to this podcast, you also won't be surprised to hear from me that this is absolute nonsense. The Middle Ages was a time of tremendous invention and innovation, curiosity and experimentation. We actually owe a whole lot to the medieval world, and I'm not just talking about Magna Carta. For today's 75th episode, our Diamond Jubilee, I invited Peter Kinechny from Medievalist.net to talk with me about one of the site's most popular articles, Medieval Inventions That Changed the World. So buckle up, kiddies, and let's learn about 10 inventions that prove the medieval era was a great time for new ideas. All right, Peter, so today we're going to talk about one of the most read articles on Medievalist.net, which is a list of some of the top medieval inventions that changed the world. So we're going to go with your list. Are you excited? I am excited. This is a a great moment in history. (laughs) We're talking about a lot of stuff from history. Okay, so I don't think that these are in any particular order for like the things that you thought were the most important, are they? Actually, they are. They are. They, you know, I kind of thought about it and said, like, all right, what what is the most influential, right, of inventions? And, you know, maybe, I, you know, there's a couple that kind of had a personal uh, importance to me. So they got, a, like, a ranked where probably they may not have been in a list of top ten. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I definitely think my like, my top three are ones that I think are had have had a real huge influence on, like, human civilization. So. Okay. Okay. So you've marked them. So like rank them as number one is number one. Is that how you've ranked them? Yeah. Okay. So let's start with number one. What is number one, maybe the most influential medieval invention? What is it, Peter? It is the clock. The clock. It is when you wake up, it's like probably the first thing you're taking a look at, even if probably it's on your phone, but it's a clock. Basically there was kind of various ways of t- uh, keeping time in like ancient times Things like the sundial and, uh, you know, various kinds of ways. But like an idea of a mechanical timepiece to kind of keep track. And it was something uh, invented like within monasteries because they needed to know when exactly they had to go and pray. And that's really hard to do at night. So (laughs) there's no sun out. And so, yeah, these kind of things kind of get invented and it just became more and more commonly used. Yeah, so we're talking about the mechanical clock, so not just any clock. And these are ones that, I mean, I don't think people would have thought of them as being medieval inventions, but they are. And some of them you can still see. So I've seen the clock that's running at Salisbury Cathedral, which is from the late 14th century. I think they they have a date around 1386 or something like that. And it's still working. You can still see it working. Oh yeah, like uh, it it becomes right around the end of the Middle Ages. It becomes really popular for like the you, the town to have a clock. Uh, so some of like our like famous landmarks. I think like Prague has a very famous medieval clock. It became a way of keeping track of the day, and and I think it was really influential, like in just how we work and like how we set around our days. So that's why you know it comes as is my number one the beautiful clock. Yes, and I think it's worth mentioning. You were talking about like figuring out when to pray during the night. There was a way to do that. There's probably more than one way to do that. But one way that you could figure it out would be to light a candle because they had candles that were marked according to how many hours had passed if it had burned down this low. So they had marked candles to figure out when to pray during the night. But a clock did make it a bit easier because that could just keep running. Oh, yeah, yeah, it sure sure did. And uh, although clocks always had to be uh, updated and like reset, probably, you know, sometimes like, twice a day so because they were just they're not that perfect and and that's that was kind of in common even into 20th century where you know clocks weren't particularly super accurate but uh thankfully uh today we don't have to worry too much about that yeah you had to wind your watch a couple times a day back 
in, you know, a hundred years ago, you had to wind your watch and you don't have to anymore. It's insane how precise our time measurement is now <laughs> compared to back then. But as you say, you had to measure the day somehow and you're trying to figure out when the canonical hours were, when you needed to pray. And everybody was following the canonical hours. And uh, with the clock, you didn't necessarily have to be a slave to those hours either. All of a sudden you could set not arbitrary but times that weren't following the canonical hours yeah and you mentioned <laughs> you're nodding but they can't see you nodding Peter. <laughs> so you mentioned in the article that this is making a difference especially in urban areas and i think that's an important thing to mention as you did where you have a town clock so all of a sudden everyone can access the time in urban areas yeah i, I think like in it's the sense that you know people could now plan out instead of having to meet we're going to meet on a specific day they could say we could meet at like at 11 a.m and everyone would know when 11 a.m would be so uh so that kind of uh, you know idea really kind of uh was a big boon to what would become industrialization and just better administration and having us all work longer and longer hours. <laughs> That's right. This is when we became slaves to the hour. <laughs> right. Okay. So mechanical clock, you say, is number one. Number two, what's next up? Number two is the printing press. Yeah. So and this uh, is one of uh, kind of several inventions that come out of China. And it is, again, incredibly influential in how we disseminate knowledge. Printing presses allowed us to develop things like paper money, you know, books, various kinds of aspects like that. And it comes into, uh, travels into Europe in the, in the uh, 15th century. Uh, we have Gutenberg. He prints the uh, edition of the Bible. So there's a lot, it becomes a lot of social and cultural changes through the printing press. But I think in like in a sense, it's just a huge dissemination of knowledge. Yeah, that's exactly right. I would put this as number one personally because uh, it does make such a difference in education because instead of having to wait for a book to be hand copied so that it could be shown around or shared around, you know, you could have a book relatively quickly. You know, you've got Gutenberg Prime or something, you can get your book really quickly. And all of a sudden, a lot more people can read and the literacy rates go up because of that. And it's, it's more than, as you say, it's more than just books. You can print other things. And I think this is important for things that we may not think of immediately, like printing out leaflets, right? Spreading the news, spreading, well, newspapers, right? Printing out leaflets. It, as we're talking, I'm thinking about like Thor Ragnarok, where he had like, is it Korg, the rock monster? He was trying to start a revolution. He needed more leaflets, I think. But things like that, they make a difference. And the printing press is huge. So if we look at dates, uh, around 11th century in China, the printing press is, well, they have printing technology. And then Gutenberg's around 1450-ish, and he's printing the Bible. And then William Caxton, for people who are interested in English history, brings that over around 1476 and starts to starts to print stuff. And one of the like, really kind of fascinating things I find about the printing press is like, is one of the things that brings Europe kind of this uh, the center of the kind of global commerce and global uh, knowledge, and it it surpasses at this point like surpasses the Islamic world, and that's a large I think largely part because the printing press wasn't very well used in the Islamic world, in particular the Ottoman Empire just uh, they didn't uh, believe that religious texts should be printed. And, of course, religious texts are the ones that make a lot of money for printers. Uh, so, you know, you get, uh, you know, printing presses spring up all throughout Europe and they're able to spread and disseminate knowledge a lot quicker. In the Islamic world, you don't have as many printing presses. And then you, as at this point, you see like scientific and uh, technological advances kind of go on the wane in that in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's being able to share knowledge and then grow that knowledge because of being able to share it across different areas. Everything is able to happen a lot faster. And thinking about it for people who are interested in language again, Caxton is the person who started to print stuff in English and you wonder why things are spelled the way they are in English. It's because it's solidified in a lot of ways, a London dialect. So the dialects are different all over England, all over the UK, and uh, it starts to solidify because of Caxton's printing press into a London dialect. And so just a little bit of trivia because I love trivia. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> Good job. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> so, right. Okay. So printing press, I would put it as number one because I think education is hugely important in how things change and grow. But certainly uh, printing press, it's going to be up in your top three, no matter how you slice it. What do you have as number three, Peter, on this list? Again, we go back to uh, medieval China, and it's the invention of gunpowder. And and it goes along with like all the kinds of other aspects with cannons, of firearms. If you're looking at military history, this might be the most important invention in all of military history. It doesn't take too long, several generations, but people figure out it has a lot of different uses. And I think when it arrives in Europe, people lay comment on it. Oh, it's just a thing that makes it funny for kids, makes a big pop. It's not going to do any much. But then people discover like this blast and what they can do with it. And uh, you can see in particular in medieval China, there's like many, many uses for gunpowder, uh, ranging from fireworks to uh, mines to, you know, uh, like, you know, all sorts of gunpowder based weaponry. We look at anything where from like 11th to 15th century China, that's full of kind of a warfare that is involving kind of gunpowder technology. And by like the 14th century, it's really uh, has spread uh, throughout Asia and into Europe uh, where they're making use of it. And there's all sorts of unique and different ways uh, that people are trying to figure it out, some of which, you know, some of which work and some of which which don't. And there's you know, we have these records of horrible uh, catastrophes where gunpowder areas uh, like uh, smithies get blown up. To me, again, it changes warfare so fundamentally and along with printing presses the, in the kind of dissemination of knowledge it really ushers in the modern state the countries the states that are able to kind of use these technologies effectively are the ones that become empires in the 16th century yeah when you think about the difference that gunpowder makes again so you're seeing in europe in the 14th century during the hundred years war there are cannons uh, for those people who are facing people who are saying that there weren't there were cannons used in the hundred years war but you look at a 14th century knight who is just covered in armor just loaded up with armor and then you look at a musketeer a couple of centuries later and the difference is immense he's not even wearing much armor of any armor because it's not even necessary a musket's going to go through it right so it, you look at sword technology they go from these heavy swords to very light swords because they don't need them if you're going to get shot you're going to get shot but even if you look at castles and this is something i wrote about for medieval warfare magazine the profile of castles goes down because when you're up against a trebuchet or people scaling the walls, you want really, really high walls. <laughs> and if you're up against a cannon, it's not the height that matters anymore. It's the thickness <laughs> and the angles of the cannons as well. So you see the profile of castles shrinks as well. So not just cannons, not just muskets, but even castles change because of this new way of waging warfare. So gunpowder is hugely important, I think. Yeah, like, uh, you know, when we, we think of like medieval ages, like the era of knights, the importance of knights, it really, you know, wanes because anyone can be trained to fire a musket or fire a cannon. And the idea is you need lots and lots of soldiers, right? So, you, you know, you're a king or a monarch. You, your idea is, well, if we can have a thousand people with guns, it's better to have 5,000 people with guns. And those are the uh, armies you win. We did a whole special, actually, with medieval warfare on the the rise of the gun. It always fascinated me, though, like, how all the ways they were experimenting with this technology and, like, coming up with ideas, some which worked and some which didn't. But people, I think, realized that this would be a, a very important game changer. By the 15th century in Europe, they, they realized that, like, this was something that everyone had to have, even if they, don't, if they didn't even know how much how well it worked. Yeah. And I think that's important, as you're saying, anybody can shoot a gun. Anybody can shoot a musket. I mean, you have to be careful because the medieval ones, they could backfire super easily. But an archer took a lifetime to train. Even a crossbowman takes a lot of strength. Even if you have, you know, a crank to winch it, it takes a lot of strength. But anybody can fire a musket. And so the profile of armies totally changes and who you can recruit and how many it's a lot different. And you can have, like you say, huge armies. You can have national armies in ways that you just didn't in the Middle Ages. Yeah, it's, it's, this was a very much a global, like, you know, Africa, Europe, Asia, many areas, they, you know, develop gunpowder technology. 
And uh, the ones that are really successful are things like the Ottoman Empire. Their success is in large measure due to their ability to uh, have guns and people to fire them. <laughs> yeah. If we're measuring so. success by conquest, <laughs> we might not measure success by conquest all the time, but that's what we're saying in this well, case. Well, the Ottoman sultans measured success by conquest. So. <laughs> that's right. So gunpowder, obviously huge. And I remember we were talking about something on a podcast earlier. I think it was when we were defining when the Middle Ages were. And for me, printing press and gunpowder really signal kind of the end of the Middle Ages. Okay, so next up on your list, we have what? Water and windmills. And these aren't necessary technology that was purely medieval, because we do have like ancient examples. But in the Middle Ages, this is when we see a really huge uh, move into being able to use these kind of mills, uh, you know, to kind of make grain, production. This is what we call like the creation of energy, you know, so where's the point where like, uh, you know, in England, we have thousands upon thousands of mills that were running uh, at times i've read like articles about like where on major rivers you'd have multiple mills along the river and we were talking like they would like make dams and then have like about 20 or 30 mills going uh, at a time you had mills that were basically boats in the middle of rivers uh very kind of fascinating and then you have windmills which uh, are most famous in the netherlands uh, where it was actually used to you know, help drain the kind of uh, lowlands of their water and create land that in the Netherlands. So to me, again, a huge influence and something we, you know, you, it's not like something we see uh, while the other inventions are something that are with us nowadays, you know, like water and windmills aren't, they're more considered just like nice old things. <laughs> Yeah, although some of the same principles are used, right, for wind power and for hydroelectric power. So like still, we are building on it. And you think about the Middle Ages and how they were using this technology, they're building on it. And they had a really high stake in that as well. When you consider how much bread was eaten in the Middle Ages, like people needed this mill power in order to live. So it was uh, super important and they're using it in different ways. Now, I might be wrong about this, but is the water wheel, the actual water wheel, is that a medieval invention? Because I think it is, but I could be wrong. We're, we're going to find out on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is as well. Like, like there's certainly water, like technology using the water, like in from like Romans uh, and stuff like that. But it really gets perfected in the Middle Ages. Yeah, and I liked what you were saying about having water being used and used and used. And so there's some articles. I'll see if I can dig them up that talk about using water for drinking and then for watering the animals and then for laundry and then downstream from that for dyeing and downstream from that for fulling and then you know using it over and over again and filling again was something that needed a mill to be used for this so really really important from everything from eating to making clothes so water and windmills super important another one of the things that we have like a lot of urbanization like you'll be able to have creation of big cities is because you can have mills produce like tons and tons of bread for city citizens so without that kind of import of food it's hard to think that you could have even towns of like hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And able to grow them on, as you were saying, like continual power. You don't run out of wind. You don't run out of water necessarily unless you redirect it or pollute it too much. But this is renewable energy and it's able to be used a lot, not for electricity, but used uh, for power, for powering things in different ways. Yeah. Super important for urbanization, as you say. Okay, speaking of urban stuff and the urban stuff that we love and may miss quite a lot, what do you have as number five? I have the coffee house, and this is something that comes up right at the end of the Middle Ages in the Arabic world, in the Ottoman world, but is something that people realize soon enough in medieval Europe that what what a great invention this was. In part, it's having coffee, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is, I believe, like coffee kind of starts out in Yemen. And kind of spreads out uh, and people realize it's quite a good drink. Uh, so and I'm not a coffee drinker myself, so uh, I'll take their word for it. But I think like for me, the coffee house was also like this is a new social environment that kind of comes up. It's uh, a reason for people to kind of gather and talk. And and that's really like a coffee house isn't just as because of coffee, but as a new way of society kind of getting together 
talking and coming up with new ideas. And like the coffee house is that symbol from the Middle East all the way to England and Ireland. Yeah, you need to have a place to get together and why not get together over a new beverage that's just come along. I think we're talking the 15th century, right? Right. As you say, right at the end of the Middle Ages. And so if you have people drinking coffee in Europe before that, it is ahistorical. People weren't drinking coffee or tea in medieval Europe till right at the very end. And that is only it's mostly east of Europe that people are exposed to this as well. So there's like, there's tea that's happening, elaborate tea ceremonies already happening in China and Japan, but they're not happening in medieval Europe until this point. So coffee houses are a thing that are happening right at the end of the Middle Ages. And if it wasn't for the medieval people, we wouldn't have our what coffee house on every corner. Peter and I are Canadians, so we know all about having a coffee shop on every corner, right, Peter? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> For us, you know, it's Tim Hortons run, you know. <laughs> and that's symbolic. When we talk about like, you know, coffee, like the idea is, you know, like this is far more important as a place than actually what it actually serves or what actually you get. Like Tim Hortons isn't, or like if you're Starbucks, it is a way of life. So. <laughs> It's where you meet. It's where you meet, especially where you meet your first date, right? <laughs> Thank goodness for coffee houses. All right. Something that maybe I would have put further up the list than coffee, though, is number six. What do you have for number six, Peter? I have eyeglasses. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel, and I think you too, feel this is a very important invention. So <laughs> we don't know too much about it, but there are like illustrations dating like back to, I think, even the 13th century where people are wearing these things that they look like eyeglasses, but as a medical technology. And the Middle Ages has a lot more medical inventions. This is the only one on our list, but it was a quite a time for a lot of uh, new medical knowledge and inventions to kind of come out. But how useful it's been for, A, me personally, but I think for many people in the world, is the, the eyeglasses and being able to see and read or or whatever but yeah and i think this is something that again started out in china first or at least sunglasses started out in china i remember reading that one time but around the late 13th century in europe a few people are credited with coming up with eyeglasses so it's one of these things that happen kind of simultaneously it's not clear who came up with them first but it's important to remember that eyeglasses were mostly for magnification at this time they weren't able to make prescriptions like we can now But I mean, magnification is so important. So you're saying like, you're noticing that I'm wearing glasses right now. This is because I've got to the age where I have to, I don't have to, but I've been encouraged to use glasses that magnify so that my eyes can last longer. And I mean, this is, this is so important, especially for, I think people who are writing, like one of the things that you'll see, and I want to come back to this in a second, you'll see a lot of illustrations of the apostles wearing eyeglasses but again it makes it possible if you can afford it for you to do things like embroidery later on you can be a part of your profession for longer than you could have before you can actually just see things which is a lot more comfortable so you're talking about glasses not looking like they do now and they don't look like they do now we have arms for our glasses and stuff but when i did the kids video on youtube in march i actually kind of put some it looks it looks more dangerous than it is but I put scissors near my nose because they actually look more like scissors you can see them in illustrations of the apostles for example and that's why I wanted to come back to you is that a lot of people will say that you know the church was anti-science the church was anti-tech but as you're saying with things like the clock and mills eyeglasses as well they're embraced by the church if they didn't start in the church they're definitely embraced by the church so this idea that you know the church was anti-tech is absolutely wrong you can see there's pictures of the apostles wearing glasses (laughs) which are actually technology yeah it'd be hard to think of anyone that was against eyeglasses right like (laughs) you know like i would think like anyone oh uh, yeah it makes me see a lot better i think that's a good i think But you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people that say, like, if something was invented, then the church would immediately say this is the work of the devil. And this is not true at all. Yeah, there's a lot of history of the science with with eyesight. And it went from like a whole different way of how people thought people actually saw things. That gets all turned around in the Middle Ages. 
to where we where we understand them and like vision and all that things uh, that kind of go with it. That is another kind of medieval technology. So and medieval invention. Yeah, and some of the sketches that I think it was Roger Bacon did look very similar to the ones you'll still see in science textbooks. So yeah, eyeglasses, really important invention. Okay, this one I think you put on the list just because of your own history. <laughs> because, you know, there's not a huge number of examples of this. But what is number seven, Peter? It is the idea of the public library. Yes. And uh, I believe this kind of starts out in Italy in the 15th century where – leading local citizens have said like we should be able to have a place where anyone can come in and read books and be able to gain that kind of knowledge and i've added this to the list a yes I, because i am a librarian i kind of believe in these things so. <laughs> but it i think it is again like when we uh, talk about like printing press and uh dissemination and knowledge you know this is another kind of example of something that's had a kind of profound impact and uh, spread worldwide where the public library is still like a, such a valuable institution for many, many people to gain access to great knowledge. Yeah. The example that you have here, and I don't know if this is the first public library, but it's the library of Malatesta Novello in Cesena, Italy in 1452. And so, I mean, you could technically borrow stuff from monasteries, but it's hard to go in and get access to stuff. So having a city library in Italy. It's a great invention. <laughs> so people can come and visit it. And it's too bad, you know, our libraries were closed for a little while this year. Hopefully people are still getting access to the books that they need. Public libraries, I mean, I'm all for them, man. Yeah, it's also one of those inventions, like it's it's a civic invention, like local uh, cities and towns and even villages that kind of come up with it. And, you know, it gives them something to provide to a larger citizenry. Even today, the public library is often like the chief and most important building of any municipal government. And I kind of think of it in that way. This is something that allows kind of local government to kind of rise up and do something that's beyond building walls and roads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as you're saying, you know, where do you put the collective knowledge that doesn't belong necessarily to the church? It belongs to the people. Well, you need to have a place for that and the people should be able to access that. So, yeah, public libraries, no longer just private libraries, but a public library for everybody to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. OK, number eight for the people who love architecture. What do you have for number eight on your list? We have the flying buttress. Right, which is a, something that can fly around. <laughs> Are we at that no. moment in the podcast where you're starting to get silly on us? <laughs> yeah, the flying buttress, it actually stays on the ground, right? Okay, tell us what a flying buttress is. This is kind of like a technology kind of comes around, I believe, in the 12th century. And it is a way that they can help support a building from the outside. In any kind of architecture, one of the things you have to worry about is the building being stable and the larger and higher you build it, the less inherently stable it is. And you need ways to keep it supported. So a flying buttress, they stick out of buildings. You see them in many cathedrals where they stick out and they are kind of ways of just having the load bearing of the walls be able to kind of spread out. And this technology is it's not important necessarily on its own, but it allows builders to create huge buildings in medieval Europe, namely cathedrals, and kind of that architectural technology, it was really massive. So, and again, like we often talk about how important the church was in medieval European life. And this is like one of the ways that the Catholic church could show out their power and influence and wealth is by making, you know, bigger and bigger churches, which we call cathedrals. Yeah, everyone picks this example, but a good example of flying buttresses is Notre Dame in Paris. So you can see that it's the things that stick out like legs that are holding up the cathedral. And instead of having so many pillars inside to keep the roof up, they were able to distribute the weight, as you say, through these flying buttresses. And so um, you say in your article, they, they've got higher ceilings, these cathedrals, all of a sudden they have thinner walls and they have bigger windows, which are all things that you can see in Notre Dame. It's a perfect example of Gothic architecture because you can see how high they can get with these flying buttresses, which they couldn't really otherwise. 
So they're flying because they're, you know, apart from the church. And I was just looking back on my shelf. I was looking at what's that book that's all about flying buttresses, like just flying buttresses, but actually really interesting. And that's Framing the Church. So we'll have to give a link to that. But in that book, the author is talking about how that space between the arch and the cathedral is a sacred space. And you got to figure out who does that belong to? Does it belong to the church? What is it used for? Does it belong to the people? And it's actually a really dis- interesting discussion about how these flying buttresses worked. But as you say, if we look at it in terms of inventions, it's mm. important because you can build these churches higher up and make them the monuments that they're supposed to be. And when you think about traveling in the Middle Ages, you're traveling by road or by boat, that's how you spot your city, right? Or a city by the church and how tall it is, how beautiful it is. So flying buttress is super important. Another thing it shows off is the kind of ability of science and mathematics. And, you know, it gets applied into architecture. It's another kind of real practical way and this is a way we can see medieval people gaining one use of knowledge to make another that is another reason i think i included on that list yeah we're going to come back to it in a couple minutes but like the use of geometry is just stunning people are now mapping out these medieval churches with lasers in part in case they get destroyed and notre dame was actually mapped out with lasers for your information, for people's information. So people can see every nuance in the stone. But when you look at it closely, the way they've used geometry in these cathedrals, it's just, it's so impressive. I mean, it's way beyond my mental capacity. (laughs) But yeah, it's amazing how they used it. And to think about how can we prop up this giant cathedral made of stone so that we can have a bigger window to better glorify God. Like, this is amazing stuff, I think. Okay. Now we're getting far, maybe far as far away from religion as you can get, or maybe not. Maybe I'm getting too philosophical, but what do you have as number nine as being important inventions in the Middle Ages? It is paper money. Paper money. Uh, Another invention through the printing press from China. This is an invention that's very largely situated in medieval China and kind of stays in medieval China, at least until the very end of the Middle Ages. And the idea here is you could set an amount that everyone could agree on because that's government backing that, you know, this piece of paper, which is really worthless in itself, has a value in it. Uh, This is something that would be incredible to ideas of trade and commerce. It's not able to kind of move out of China. And there's one like funny tale where when the Mongols conquer China and they also conquer the Middle East, uh, they were very good at having paper money in China. But when they tried to develop it and pass this idea into the Ilkhanate, which is the Middle East, uh, the Mongol rule, the people hated paper <laughs> money. It got introduced and said, oh, what a great idea. And like nobody was like, no, this is terrible. We don't want to use this. It got to a point where people would get robbed by like bandits in the countryside and bandits would give them the paper money. <laughs> here's, here's the money. We're paying for it. <laughs> and uh, it lasted just like a year or two. So like and then they gave up. And because people I don't think most people are like, oh, you know, we there's something physical in gold and silver. But. By the end of the Middle Ages, we we see a lot of transactions just being taken uh, through ledgers and by paper with banks and things like that. In the early modern period, paper money gets uh, more widely used and is something that, you know, is pretty common even today. Although, you know, we may be reaching the end of that era where now we're going to be able to digital currency instead of physical ones. So, <laughs> Well, when you think about it, that's got to have been a hard sell, right? If you give someone a piece of paper, it can't really be used for anything else. Whereas if you give someone a piece of gold, you can melt that down and use it for something else. You know, it's useful. It must have been a hard sell. <laughs> but when you think about how far people were trading, especially in China, like the weight of paper is nothing. You know, it's nothing compared to like the equivalent amount of money and coins. So it's totally practical. You can see why people adopted that later, but also why it was a hard sell at the beginning, I think. (laughs) So paper money, I don't think there's much else to say about paper money, except for it was at the end of the Middle Ages. And again, an invention that came out of China that's super useful and relevant today. Another invention dealing with paper from China is toilet paper. (laughs) Yeah, you didn't mention that. I would think that is really important day to day. Maybe more important than coffee, I think, for most people. (laughs) Yeah. 
found out that one after I did this kind of post. So, but yes, like the toilet paper. Uh, uh, other people from other parts of the world. Oh, look at this, how funny it is. People use in China they use little bits of paper to clean their bottoms. <laughs> who, who knew that would take off, right? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Enter 2020. <laughs> When all of a sudden there is a shortage of toilet paper. All right. That brings us to number 10, the final one. What do we have for number 10? I put them together. It's the quadrant and astrolobe. Yeah. So these are like sci basically scientific devices to help you figure out where you are. They're fairly technical and, you know, fairly hard to kind of, you know, imagine, but they make use of like how you kind of position yourself like on the earth, you know, via stars or, or, or whatnot, but it allows people to travel and un better understand geography. The 15th century comes is kind of for, for Europe, the age of exploration by going by sea. And it's this, these kind of devices are, would be on like every ship. It was just uh, something that would be needed. Yeah. And these are older. They're older than the Middle Ages, but they're kind of, again, adapted, perfected, maybe not perfected, but improved upon in the Middle Ages. Before this, you know, you had dead reckoning by the stars, but the astrolabe, and I actually went to a, a session on at Kalamazoo on the astrolabe that was based on Chaucer's treaties, which he wrote for his son, Lewis, in the late 14th century, which is, which is cute. And it also, I mean, when you have like kids books from the Middle Ages, you can teach people <laughs> about it as well. So I wrote on this for Medievalist.net when I did it. But things that I didn't realize about the astrolabe was they can tell you not only you know, where you are and when you are, like what day is it, which you might easily lose track of on the sea. But you can also find out things like when the sunrise will be, when the sunset will be. You can work forwards to find out like when the sunset will be on a certain day in the future. Or you can work backwards to find out which day you're at right now. And it's like, it's fascinating how this works. And again, totally beyond my understanding, except for the fact that, you know, Chaucer explains it. If you do look at that, it's important to remember that Chaucer is using a Julian calendar. So it's nine days different from our calendar. He uses March 12th as his date, which means it's March 21st, if we're trying to figure it out. Just just so you know. But if you look up my article on astrolabes on medievalist.net, there was a link, I hope it still works, to one that you could print out and make and use for yourself. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I know. That's, that's a, like, almost is a fun thing to do is create your own astrolab. Yeah. <laughs> and and some of the other things that we've talked about, you know, here and, and with this one, it allows people to gain sources of information, right? Things that they won't be able to like understand, like, you know, when, what the date was or when sunset would be those kind of like things that we take for kind of common now in the middle ages, you know, like learning about this gives people a lot of scientific knowledge uh, and tools to kind of discover other things. So it makes it like a, you know, fascinating kind of, you know, way of exploration and discovery. Yeah. I mean, if you picture a world without GPS and a world without electric lights, you want to know when it's going to be dark and where you're going to be at that time, right? It's important stuff. And um, if you look on the internet, you can see where quadrants and astrolabes have actually been combined as well to make like a super Swiss army knife, I guess, of uh, reckoning, which is really super interesting. Yeah. So I think that it does belong on this list. I mean, the Middle Ages, to kind of like sum it up, came up with a whole bunch of inventions. And when I hear people talking about this being a dark age where like science was sleeping or it went backwards, it's like absolutely ridiculous. Only people who haven't actually looked into this ever would be saying this because there are so many inventions that happen. When we talked to Eric Quackel at the beginning of the podcast, you know, we're talking about the Codex, which is could be considered early medieval, late antiquity. Like the shape of the books that we have now, you know, we owe to these people in the super early Middle Ages. So science and technology definitely, definitely alive in the Middle Ages. And it's because of them that we've been able to get where we are today. Yeah, and I, I think we also forget that how inquisitive medieval people could be. Uh, you know, we, we have like wonderful examples of people doing things like making medieval robots or doing a medical experiments and trying to understand there's quite a lot of that kind of going on when you have people that want to kind of figure out problems and they're 
they've become like, well, let's not worry about, uh, you know, what the ancients said about it. Because like there's an uh, idea that people in the Middle Ages, they just listened to what the Greek philosophers or, or Roman doctors said about something and just blindly agreed to that. And that's not true. And you can just see all this kind of creativity that kind of comes out and it's coming up with new ideas, some of which don't work, right? Like sometimes they, they you know, they go down the wrong path, which is what we call alchemy, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Like, hey, if someone could make iron into into gold, that would be a best top invention, I'm sure, in our list. But that never happened. I mean, seriously, um, put the research into that. <laughs> there, well, there's a whole lot of articles people can look at on Medievalist.net where you see people try to invent flying machines and submarines. Not only, you know, robots. Yeah, robots, flying machines, submarines, like all of these things that we think that, oh, we've thought of or that Jules Verne thought of, you know, 100 years ago well, more than 100 years ago, these are things that people have been thinking about for a really long time and in the Middle Ages working on as well. Yeah, yeah. People were looking at doing new ways. And I think like, you know, it's something that, you know, you think the Middle Ages is this one like monolithic block and that's not how it was. And there's, you know, at certain places, certain times we have, you know, the, the wonderful art that we see, like Renaissance art is, is really medieval art. This is, like, you know, art that emerges in the 14th century. But even manuscripts and from creating porcelain dishes to gold figurines, we just see that kind of explosion of creativity. A lot of it was based on like scientific and mechanical knowledge. There's a great series of books about technology and science in, in medieval China, started by uh, Charles Needham. And it's now like, I think I like 30 volumes. This is a huge collection that talks about like all this kind of vast knowledge that's came out of that one corner of the medieval world. And like, yeah, you come across like a lot of people doing interesting things and making discoveries. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And clearly we can talk about this forever, but we should probably wrap it up. So thanks, Peter. People can find that actual article on Medievalist.net. But we've already added a whole bunch of stuff to that as well. And you can find lots of stuff on Medieval Technology on Medievalist.net because we love it. I don't, know, I don't know if you can tell. What else can we find on Medievalist.net this week? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we, um, James Turner, uh, he was, he's been one of our columnists. And he just finished a 10-part series. It was called A Bastard's Lot, The Illegitimate Royal Children of 12th Century England. So uh, he did 10 pieces uh, that kind of looked at various kinds of illegitimate like offspring of like Henry the first and Henry the second, what they were doing, like what kind of roles they had within government and supporting or not supporting the royal family. So it was really interesting uh, series. So uh, it's now finished up. We also have another series that's in the middle right now is on medieval Scandinavia and looking at the rise and fall of the kingdoms from the Norse to the end of the Middle Ages. This month's article is on the Kingdom of Norway, which really is interesting because it becomes the, the most centralized state in Scandinavia. So which is you wouldn't kind of think that, but uh, it's a fairly good piece on that. So you can read all that and more on Medievalist.net this week. Excellent. And the last thing I want to mention while you're here is for the people who are on the fence about becoming our patrons on patreon.com. If you do it before the end of August, you get to get that amazing map that we're going to have on medieval Africa in the 14th century. I'm like super excited about this. So I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to get this map, right? So it's medieval oh, yeah. Africa, right? Yeah, yeah. Tina and I are already planning it out. If you signed up last month, you'd be getting a map of England in around 1066. And we're going to have like a, like over 100 like different points uh, mm -hmm. to kind of show you in like what, what was England. So it's going to be a, we're going to try and make these maps pretty detailed for you. So uh, and I hope you really enjoy them. I, like Tina is loving do, do this and I think it's going to be a great little thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's still a few days left if you want to become a patron of the medieval podcast at the map level, the one you're going to get for August is the medieval Africa map, which Tina is going to be working on very, very soon. So I'm super excited. Well, thank you, Peter, for joining me to talk about medieval inventions. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'm sure we'll do it again. <laughs> I have no doubt. Thanks. Thank you to everybody who's already a patron on Patreon.com. And if you're interested in our maps or just supporting the podcast, you can find us at Patreon.com slash Medievalists. 
for everything from amazing inventions to bizarre incantations. Follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sobalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And if you're interested in how medieval inventions and ideas might help us once again, you might want to check out my little book, The 5 Minute Medievalist's Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse, which you can find at Amazon or from my Canadian friends, Indigo Online. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an amazing day.